All right, good morning, everyone. Um, or good afternoon, I guess, now that it's past noon. Um, let's see, where are we at here? There we go. I'm sure you have seen that. If you haven't seen that, there's the distribution of scores on the exam. The exam average was 64.5, and uh, the high was 95. The low was, I said it was uh, 18. I think the low was actually 19. Um, so it was an interesting distribution. You can see uh, a group here and then another group here. Um, a little odd there. Um, and a lot of scores in this area right in here. Um, not so many out here, and there usually are fewer out here, of course, but um, this seemed to be even fewer than, than normal. So I was a little disappointed out here, um, of course disappointed out here, um, but overall um, I think people did reasonably well on the exam. Um, I haven't yet tallied the uh, percent correct on each section that the class did, but my impression looking at it was that the matching people did pretty well on. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if you still want me to rethink doing matching or not. I will let you know after I tally it. But every single person I've talked to this morning said they did better on the matching than they thought they did. So um, I will look at it and I will, I will consider other options. But just my gut feeling in looking at it was that people did fairly well in the matching. Okay. Uh, if you haven't picked up your exams, they are available in ALS 2011, and there's a key posted outside my door, so please check both, and you'll be set. So I hope you had a good weekend. Uh, I know I did. I got caught up on a lot of things, and I'm very happy for that. So I want to dive in. Last time I finished up <coughs> talking about how oxidation of unsaturated fatty acids occurs, and I pointed out that with basically two different enzymes, you can handle virtually every unsaturated fatty acid that is out there. Okay? So that's pretty cool. That allows the cells to go on and to do uh, oxidation of those uh, so they can use unsatur unsaturated fatty acids for energy. What I want to talk about now um, is another uh, oxidation of another class of fatty acids. And these are fatty acids that have odd numbers of carbons. Now, as I said, most fatty acids uh, in general have an even number of carbons based on the way that they're made, but there are uh, some odd-numbered fatty acids that are out there. The odd-numbered fatty acids um, pose a problem not during the normal beta oxidation, at least not until the end. And it's at the end that instead of having an acetyl-CoA that's left, where you split a four and a half to get two acetyl-CoAs, you end up with an acetyl-CoA and a propionyl-CoA. So that leaves you with a three carbon molecule. The um, thiolase, or the beta oxidation system, will not tackle this guy. It will not cut between these two carbons. And so there has to be a different way then of handling propionyl-CoA um, that arises from odd number of carbons in a fatty acid. Well, the pathway that the cell uses is odd, okay? And I think that's uh, a safe thing to say. Of all the metabolic pathways that cells use, this is one of the oddest. And it's an important one. If we can't handle this, uh, these odd number of carbons of fatty acids, the cells have problems, okay? So there are some uh, issues that arise uh, in diseases, for example, for people who lack the ability to do this. Now, what I want to do is step you through um, what happens and then hopefully convince you why this is very odd. So here's a three carbon fatty acid, propionyl-CoA. The cell decides that, well, to, ox to, to use this in some way, I'm, I need to put another carbon onto it. And so it does just that. It takes a, a bicarbonate ion, takes an ATP, and it attaches um, a, a carboxyl group to the end of the molecule or near the end of the molecule right here, okay? This creates uh, an intermediate called D-methylmalonyl-CoA. And then as soon as the cell has done that, it decides that it doesn't really like the D configuration. It changes it to an L configuration, okay? And then it decides after having done the L configuration that it actually wanted that carbon on the end, not in the middle. So now it moves that carbon dioxide down to the end carbon so that we have a straight chain, which makes succinyl-CoA. 
Now, I don't have any idea why this uh, pathway uh, goes the way that it does. I honestly don't. It takes three enzymes to do something that really should require a single reaction. That is taking and putting that carbon dioxide on the end of that molecule right there. But suffice it to say that that is exactly, in fact, what happens in the metabolism of propionyl-CoA. Now, this odd set of reactions, this moving of these groups that we see here, actually involves and requires vitamin B12. Okay? So vitamin B12 is a necessary reaction for uh, this uh, process. And as a consequence, in, the, in an absence of vitamin B12, a person could not go through and do these sets of reactions. Vitamin B12 uh, is also called cyanocobalamin, which you don't need to know the name of. You call it vitamin B12, that's fine. However, uh, what I will tell you is that that compound is the only compound in the body that uses cobalt. Okay? So cobalt is a micronutrient that is necessary for human beings because of vitamin B12. Okay? So that's, uh, in a in, in nutshell, what happens. Once we get to succinyl-CoA, of course, you know succinyl-CoA can be oxidized uh, in the citric acid cycle or the glyoxylate cycle, depending upon uh, the organism, and uh, we're off and running. Yes, Jenny. Are there any organisms that can do this in one step? Uh, good question. Are there any organisms that can do this in one step? I don't know of any that do. So it looks like the system uh, evolved um, to go this way, and then that's passed along from, from, from cell to cell. I don't know, um, I mentioned uh, glyoxylate cycle, and I don't even actually know if, if plants do this because plants don't use external sources of fatty acids other than what they make. Uh, carnivores, for example, are eating things from a variety of places and have more needs for doing that. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if, if maybe a Venus flytrap does, but, uh, but uh, sort of a carnivorous plant, I'm not sure if plants would, would need the pathway. Yes, right. Oh, what? well, symptoms of not having enough vitamin B12, the number one symptom that comes out is something called pernicious anemia. Okay, so pernicious anemia is a, um, it's a, um, uh, some of the symptoms of that include low energy, uh, lack of drive, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the most common problems associated with, with uh, vitamin B12 are actually the inability of people to get it uh, absorbed through their intestines. So you absorb it from your food. And the only sources of vitamin B12 are all animal in nature. So if you're vegan, you need to uh, take vitamin B12 supplements or you will get deficient in vitamin B12. So if, you, if you're vegetarian, you get milk and cheese and so forth, you're fine. Uh, it doesn't take very much, but a strict vegan will have in time a, a problem with vitamin B12. Okay, so that's the oxidation of odd chain fatty acids. And let's see, there's vitamin B12. There's its structure. I think you, can, you should be able to draw that on the next exam. Wouldn't you love to do that? Man, what a, what a nightmare. There's cobalt right there. And the cobalt actually plays an important role in holding on to methyl groups. And uh, I won't go through the mechanism, the methyl group that you saw on the end of that um, uh, methylmalonyl-CoA actually is uh, attached to that co uh, uh, cobalt during the mechanism of the reaction. And no, I'm not going to do that. OK. I mentioned peroxisomes. And if you recall, I said that in the peroxisomes, um, that's the place where fatty acids that have a length greater than 16 carbons start their oxidation. Okay. So the acyl-CoA dehydrogenases, that is those first enzymes that start the oxidation of fatty acids, Remember, there were three forms. They had a long chain, a medium chain, and a short chain. And the long chain uh, acyl-CoA dehydrogenases are found only in the peroxisomes. So there's a peroxisome. And peroxisomes, of course, are not mitochondria. And you might say, well, so what? Well, the so what is that, if you think about it, mitochondria are very well set up to deal with excess NADH and FADH2, right? And NADH and FADH2 are generated during the oxidation of fatty acids. So what in the world does the peroxisome do with these things that accumulate? Okay. 
Well, because there's no electron transport chain that it can pass these things off to in the peroxisome, right? That's how the mitochondria deals with it. In the peroxisome, it's interesting. What happens is the um, uh, protons and electrons are donated to oxygen to make hydrogen peroxide. Okay? They're donated to oxygen to make hydrogen peroxide. So oxygen is the electron acceptor in the peroxisome, just like it is in the mitochondria, the difference being that it's going directly to the oxygen instead of going through an electron transport system. So what does that say about the first rounds of oxidation of the, in the peroxisome? Not very efficient, right? It's not very efficient at all. So you're going to lose energy in the peroxisome compared to what you would have in the mitochondria. You're going to make hydrogen peroxide, and hydrogen peroxide, you may recall, is a reactive oxygen species. That's kind of nasty. Well, it turns out that that hydrogen peroxide is actually useful in some cases. In one case, it's useful. The peroxisome is involved in oxidative degradation of molecules. So having a reactive oxygen species actually helps the peroxisome to break down molecules. Another place where hydrogen peroxide is useful is in the immune system. The immune system will um, release reactive oxygen species to kill invading cells. And so one of the things that they will release, particularly for bacteria, is hydrogen peroxide. And that kills bacteria because they don't have a good way of handling it. We have enzymes in our cells that will handle it. Bacteria don't have enzymes that will handle that for the most part. Okay? So hydrogen peroxide, though it is kind of nasty, is something that if it's properly handled, the cell has uh, some use for. And that comes from uh, the peroxisome. <laughs> Okay, and that's more than I want. That's what I just showed you, basically. So I'm not going to go through that. Yes, uh, Kyle. Macrophages of the immune system will uh, have use that perox that, that hydrogen peroxide to kill cells. So yes, they will do that. Actually, the question is, he says that they, the macrophage will not just release it to kill bacteria. In fact, it will. So one of the things it'll do is it'll increase the concentration of um, hydrogen peroxide around bacteria uh, or other things that it's trying to um, damage. So yes, it will. OK, uh, let's see. The, last, or the next thing to talk about is a very interesting pathway um, that's related to um, fatty acid oxidation, and it's known as ketone body synthesis. Okay? Ketone bodies. I've mentioned them before. Now we're going to see how they're made. So ketone bodies um, are made starting with acetyl-CoA. All right? So for the moment, I want you to think about not what you see on the screen, but rather thinking back to beta oxidation. When I had beta oxidation, I started with a fatty acid that, let's say, had 16 carbons, right? And I started chopping them off two at a time. I had something that had 14, I had something that had 12, 10, 8, 6, and I got down to 4, right? So I had something that had 4 carbons, and I, when I try to oxidize that, I create, I create something that is this guy right here. This is what would happen to, this is what a fatty acid that had been oxidized by beta oxidation would look like when it got down to 4 carbons. Well, in the normal scheme of things, thiolase would clip this guy right here. It would add a CoA, and you would go to the left, and you would get two acetyl CoAs out of that. That would be the very last step in the oxidation of a fatty acid. Okay? Well, what this figure is showing you is that in making ketone bodies, the reaction is run backwards. So that instead of going to the left and making two acetyl CoAs, we start with two acetyl CoAs and we end up with acetoacetyl CoA. So we're going to the right. Now, <coughs> excuse me. That acetoacetyl CoA can gain another two carbons from another acetyl CoA and in doing so create an intermediate that has six carbons 
And this intermediate should look familiar to you because we saw it in what metab metabolic pathway? Cholesterol, okay? So cholesterol had HMG-CoA as an intermediate. I said we went one direction to go to um, the um, um, cholesterol biosynthesis, and I said we went the other direction to go make ketone bodies. All right, And that's exactly what's happening here. As usual, this thing is decided. Go off. Hold on, I'm going to get a battery. This time I brought my own. It gives you a chance to get caught up on your writing while I'm sitting here babbling. Ryan, this is Kevin in Milan Auditorium. Once again, the wireless microphone batteries are dead. There's no replacement batteries in here. Can somebody make sure there's replacement batteries in the room for that? Thank you. Ta -da. Okay, now we're back. So, we got to HMG CoA. We're at that branch point, and now we're going to make uh, acetoacetate. All that we're doing is we're just clipping off a of CoA. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say it. We're clipping off an acetyl CoA, but what we're doing is we're clipping off a different one from, from the way it went on. The bottom line being we're getting a four carbon compound out of here that is, in fact, a ketone body. Okay? So acetoacetyl-CoA is not a ketone body, but acetoacetate by itself is a ketone body. Well, why do we care about ketone bodies? Ketone bodies are essential molecules for keeping the brain alive when you run out of glucose. So if you're hypoglycemic, your glucose levels fall very low, your brain, your eyes rely on glucose, they can't make glucose, they have to get it from the bloodstream. And if the bloodstream is not providing it, the last gasp for the brain and for the eyes is acetoacetate. Acetoacetate can be converted into either dihydroxybutyrate, which is also a, a ketone body, even though it's not technically, technically a ketone, or it can be oxidized to acetone. Now, this reaction that occurs to acetone is an oxidation reaction, it's non-enzymatic. This means that this guy right here is chemically unstable, and at a certain rate, it will convert to acetone. Now, I'll tell you how the brain uses this in a minute, but I want you to focus on this synthesis of acetone. The synthesis of acetone is important because if you are hypoglycemic, you will actually exhale acetone on your breath. You wonder why you have bad breath? Just say you're hypoglycemic, okay? It's the acetone coming out. The health consideration for this is that many people who are diabetic actually go hypoglycemic at various phases in their um, uh, diabetes and exhale this, okay? So one of the ways that people learn they're diabetic is they have a friend who noticed you've got acetone in your breath, okay? And in which case, if that, somebody tells you that, you should contact your doctor. Seriously. And I've actually known people in this class, not this particular class, but in, in 451, who learned they were diabetic because somebody noticed that and smelled it on their breath. So be aware of that. Okay? Acetone, per se, is not useful as a ketone body. The only thing it does, it just gets exhaled from the lungs. Okay. Well, I promised you I would tell you why or how this is useful. All right? Acetone and beta, I'm sorry, and, and hydroxy, 3 hydroxybutyrate can both be moved through the blood system to the brain. Okay? So when they get to the brain, what happens is if it's 3-hydroxybutyrate that gets there, then the reaction is run backwards to make acetoacetate. If acetoacetate makes it there, it's ready for the next reaction, which is adding a CoA. So basically what's going to happen in the brain is we're going to take everything back to the left. We're going to move everything back to the left, ultimately releasing acetyl-CoA's for the brain cells. The acetyl-CoA's are then 
uh, useful in the citric acid cycle for oxidation and for energy. So this is a way of keeping energy there for the brain even when um, glucose is not available. Yes, Megan. How does acetyl-CoA give energy for the brain? Because it gets oxidized in the citric acid cycle. And so oxidation in the citric acid cycle generates NADH, which generates electron transport, oxidative phosphorylation, ATP. Okay. okay? Everybody got that? Yeah, uh, yes, Jane. So if you're running the citric acid cycle, but you're not running glycolysis, where are you getting your NADHs? Uh, if you're running citric acid cycle, but you're not running glycolysis, Remember, it's going on in the mitochondria, and so you're getting NAD from the fact that it's dumped electrons off to electron transport, right? So you don't need glucose for energy in the brain as long as you have an acetyl-CoA source, and that's what this is providing. Everybody understand that? Clear slide? Yes? Um, so does your body just constantly make this? No. So, good question. Does your body constantly make this? No. The times when your body is going to make this is when your glucose levels are very low. So when you go hypoglycemic, your liver will start cranking this stuff out so that your brain has, um, has energy that it needs. Okay? It's a very fast form of energy, and it actually helps the brain. It, if you think about it, what it's doing is it's using acetyl-CoA as an energy source for the brain. And it's packaging it up into these molecules Okay, that make it to the brain, and then they come back and release acetyl-CoA. Uh, no, I've got the, the double A's. Okay, thanks, Brian. But, but, but anyway, tell them to, if you yeah. would tell them, I, I, I've got it right now, I, I, I use my own batteries. Yeah. But if you would tell them to leave some, some fresh double A batteries in here, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. okay, they never do, so thanks. Yes, uh, uh, Stephanie. Is acetyl-CoA not able to be transported in the blood? Acetyl-CoA, as such, is not transported in the blood. So I, I guess the answer is no, it's not. Remember, acetyl-CoA is generated normally during either oxidation of glucose in the mitochondrion or in the oxidation of fatty acids, which is also in the mitochondrion. So in general, it's not available outside of cells. Okay? All right, what I started to say was, so the, these acetyl-CoA's now are actually an energy source because this provides a packaging mechanism to get them out into the bloodstream, where they can get to the, the, the brain, and then the brain goes backwards and uses those in the citric acid cycle. Everybody got that? Okay, all right, so it's kind of cool. So um, one of the questions I get, I didn't get it this time, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it out. Maybe I should make this an exam question, all right? And I'll just throw it out for you here. What do you think would happen if you're taking statins? Statins, statins, whatever you want to call them. Lovastatin. What does lovastatin do? And it was HMG coa reductase. How does that affect this? So if we had HMG coa reductase in the cholesterol pathway, this would go to mevalonate, right? So if this can't go to mevalonate, what's going to happen to the concentration of this? It's going to go up, right? If the concentration of that goes up, what do you suppose is going to happen to all this stuff? Okay, I don't have an answer for the question. I'm asking, I'm asking a question I don't have an answer for. But you would predict that simply by increasing the concentration of this, you probably would be favoring ketone body production. So it wouldn't be surprising that you might find a person who's taking lovastatin who might have acetone on the breath. Wouldn't be wouldn't be totally surprising, Laurie? So did you mention earlier that acetone also goes to the brain? No, acetone acetone will circulate in the bloodstream, but basically once it gets to the lungs, it volatilizes and goes out. So it's not something that's useful to the brain for energy. No, it's not. Kyle. Well, okay, so if you're taking statins, you wouldn't want to go hungry. Um, well, this isn't producing fat. This is producing energy for the brain. If you're saying that you're, you're favoring these guys, 
I'm not sure I totally agree with that. Because if you're low on energy, you're going to oxidize these guys. So I don't think you're going to make fat under those conditions. Well, you can't do gluconeogenesis from acetate. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that would be a problem. I don't think going, going hungry would be a problem, to be honest. Um, but what you might see is you might see increased ketone body production. That might happen. Laurie? Yeah, it's a good question. And again, I don't have the answer for it. Uh, my suspicion is that this, in fact, will drive the reaction back to the left. But because you're blocked right here, okay, that's going to necessarily, I think, cause this to be in higher concentration than otherwise. That's my, my take on it. Because you're never going to have zero of anything. Okay? And if you don't have zero of anything, then that's still going to allow some things to come this direction. Now you've got a block at this point. I think it will increase HMG. I, I don't know. That, that's my speculation. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I play one in front of my classroom, basically, right? Okay. Yes, Jenny, one last question. Is acetone, good for acetone is not good for anything. No. Why do we, we don't make it. It's, it's, it's chemically unstable. We don't synthesize it. This guy here is chemically unstable, and it oxidizes uh, readily. So as a consequence, this guy is made, and it's, it's thrown away. So it's not useful. No. We normally think of these things as, well, there's an enzyme that's there, so therefore it's useful for us to make it. But this is a non-enzymatic reaction. And due to its chemical instability, that's why we see this thing being formed. You don't look very satisfied with that answer. I'm just trying to figure out how the body tries to regulate, like, acetoacetate concentrations. You don't know the body has it. Well, the way that it regulates it is, uh, one, this pathway isn't going very much uh, unless you're in low energy. So that's one way. And this is a necessary price that the body pays in order to make this and this. One of the ways it avoids making acetone is by going up here. This guy is chemically stable. This guy is not so chemically stable. So it does try to avoid that, which is why you see this other intermediate being produced. But in the meantime, you do make some acetone. It's just a price of doing business, I, I think. OK. Well, let's turn our attention from that to now looking at the synthesis of fatty acids. And um, here's one of the places where I think you will find that learning something in fatty acid oxidation helps you. Now, as I said, there are a couple wrinkles that are different. And we'll start out with one of them. But most of the other things are simply the reversal of reactions that we've seen before. One of the differences in fatty acid synthesis compared to fatty acid oxidation is that fatty acid synthesis starts with a three carbon intermediate. It starts with a three carbon intermediate. The three carbon intermediate is a malonyl group. All right? Now, here's the group, that, that, that. You see it linked here to a CoA. And we'll see that actually also changes later. But it's a three carbon group that is the starting point for the synthesis of the fatty acid. Okay? This is how it's put on. It's an energy requiring reaction. It requires ATP. Just as making the fatty acids is going to require ATP, it's going to require electrons because we have to reduce those acetate uh, things that are going on. And the electrons in fatty acid synthesis come from a new molecule, NADPH. So NADPH is the source of electrons for fatty acid synthesis. NADPH is just like NADH, except for it has an extra, it has a phosphate on it. And NADPH is commonly the electron donor for biosynthetic reactions. This is a prime biosynthetic reaction making fatty acids. NADPH. Now, you might wonder, where do we get NADPH? And we don't talk about it much in this class. I'll mention it briefly. Uh, but the, the prime place where we get NADPH is from a pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. That's where NADPH is mostly produced in the cell, the pentose phosphate pathway. And we'll talk briefly about that later. But for, for now, I want to talk about fatty acid synthesis. So you see that we're going to start with a three-carbon intermediate. 
it's a malonyl group. And the other thing that we have to see is that the CoA in fatty acid synthesis is replaced by a protein called ACP. ACP stands for acyl carrier protein. And here's what it looks like on the screen. Okay, it's got, it's really a protein. And sticking off of the protein is a phosphopentathiene group. Probably you don't recognize that name, but phosphopentathiene is the same group that's on the end of coenzyme A. So the handle that's on there holding on to the acyl group is the same handle that coenzyme A used. Okay? So that handle is attached to an acyl carrier protein. And that handle is then linked to a fatty acid and acyl group. That's why it's called acyl carrier protein. So once we have made malonyl CoA, the CoA is replaced by ACP. Now, to start a fatty acid synthesis, we actually have to have a two carbon and a three carbon piece. So that means we have to have an acetyl piece as well. And so instead of having acetyl CoA, we have acetyl ACP. So I want you to keep those two molecules in your head, acetyl ACP and malonyl ACP, because they're going to be our starting point for fatty acid biosynthesis. So all of the synth synth synthetic reactions for fatty acid biosynthesis involve ACP. Okay. Fatty acid biosynthesis occurs out in the cytoplasm and endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? We'll talk about that in a bit, but for the most part, it's occurring out in the cytoplasm. Here is the first step in the process. Here's our acetyl ACP. Here's a malonyl ACP. The first thing that happens is these two guys join together and this carbon dioxide that's on the end gets lost. So this carbon joins with this carbon, and the carbon dioxide that was there gets lost. Everybody with me? We have made something that looks like that acetoacetate that we saw before, except for now it's linked to an ACP instead of being linked to a CoA. The first step in that process then is we've got to reduce this ketone to an alcohol. There's the electrons, NADPH. This creates an intermediate whose name is not of importance, but whose orientation is. Remember this was an L configuration in the oxidation. It's the D configuration during synthesis. So the orientation of that hydroxyl is D during biosynthesis in fatty acid synthesis, it's L during fatty acid oxidation. Okay, once Gesundheit, once we are at the hydroxyl group, the next thing is going to involve dehydration, loss of water. So we're going to take off this OH and one of these hydrogens, and we're going to create a trans double bond again, just like we saw before. Again, we're not worried about the name. Notice all the action between carbons two and three, just as we saw before. Once we've got the double bond, we have another reduction. Again, electrons coming from NADPH. Voila, we've made a fatty acid that has two more carbons. Now, this guy will then be the starting point for the next one. So the next one will get two more carbons out here. And we build it with exactly the same reactions that you've been seeing so far. Now you guys are probably noticing that I haven't given you any enzyme names. And you're probably saying, Kevin, please give us enzyme names. Aren't you? Okay, you've convinced me. All right? I'll give you a very simple enzyme name. Okay? There's two enzymes that we'll have to know. The simple enzyme name is all these reactions that I've been talking about, putting together the threes and the twos to make the four and then go through this stuff. Starting from acetyl ACP and malonyl ACP, all the enzymes have the same name. They're all called fatty acid synthase. Very nice, simple name. 
And all of the enzyme activities, it's very interesting, are part of a giant complex. That's why we can call it all by the same name. So the first one where we had the reduction, that was part of a complex. And what happens in this complex is the fatty acid rotates like a wheel. It rotates, the first reaction occurs, the second reaction occurs, the third reaction occurs, etc., in a circle. So by the time it's gone one complete rotation of the wheel, two more carbons have been added, and the wheel is ready to add two more carbons, and it goes around again. So that's what fatty acid synthase does. Okay, everybody, got me, everybody with me on that? That's what fatty acid synthase done, does. Fatty acid synthase only makes fatty acids up to 16 carbons long. And it only makes saturated fatty acids. So 16 carbons long, saturated fatty acids, that's the product of fatty acid synthase. Everybody with me? Now, there, I said there's two enzymes. What's the second enzyme? Well, I haven't given you the name of a very important enzyme for making that first malonyl-CoA. Remember back when we made the three-carbon group? Okay, so I'll remind you. Going back to the very first reaction, I said we had to have a three-carbon group, and that three-carbon group, shown right here, going from acetyl-CoA to malonyl-CoA, that three-carbon group is made by the only regulatory enzyme of fatty acid biosynthesis. The name of the enzyme is acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Now this turns out to be a really interesting enzyme. It's regulated by both covalent modification and by allosteric control. Don't you love those that have more than one type of modification? What do you suppose the covalent modification is? Phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, okay? So phosphorylation has um, an important effect on this enzyme. It actually causes it to depolymerize, okay? Um, and that is, actually, let me come back to that. Let me come back to that. So I'll, I'll talk about regulation. I, I want to talk about um, a couple things here first. So. Yes. Uh huh. Up to 16. So how does it determine whether it's going to make a shorter one? Whether it's going to be what? How does it determine whether it's going to make a shorter one? Yeah, that's a good question. How does it determine it's going to make a shorter one or not? Uh, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Did I, did I get your question right? Yeah. Oh, I think you were laughing. Maybe I didn't get your question right. Uh, the, um, I think what happens is it simply falls out of the complex. Um, that would be my guess. I don't know, but you're right. Cells do make fatty acids shorter than 16. They make 10, 12, 14 uh, long fatty acids. And I think it simply falls out of the complex, but I, I don't know that for sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, are there ways that you can make longer than 16 carbon fatty acids? Or yes. The question is, is, are there ways to make fatty acids longer than 16 carbons? The answer is yes, there are, and I'll talk about those later. Uh, but, but yes, there are, and we have to make them longer than that. Okay. Yes, Jenny. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm speculating on the falling out in the first place. So I, I, I would, I'd be speculating on that as well. So I'll double speculate and say, sure. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. OK, here's a summary of what happens. All right, Here's the different names of the individual enzymes. There's our friend acetyl-CoA carboxylase for that very first reaction. All the rest of these guys are, are part of fatty acid synthase. All the rest are part of fatty acid synthase. So it makes it very simple for you to know. You don't have to know all these other names. You need to know fatty acid synthase and acetyl-CoA carboxylase. OK. Um, this is a very dumb figure, but it's trying to show you that clockwise thing that I was describing to you that uh, I don't think they do it very well. I like my clock figure better. And by the way, the clock figure is known to happen. What's very interesting about the mechanism of this clock enzyme, the fatty acid synthase enzyme, is the mechanism that's used 
um, appears to be followed all the way through evolutionary history from bacteria up to human beings, all use that same sort of clockwise or clock mechanism uh, for making the fatty acids. Okay, um, something I needed to talk about uh, was, and this actually relates to metabolic control, is, well, fatty acid biosynthesis is occurring out in the cytoplasm, but the place where we have most of our acetyl-CoA is in the mitochondria. Okay, how do we deal with that? Well, it turns out that in the mitochondrion, um, we're very good at taking that acetyl-CoA that we have and combining it with oxaloacetate to make citrate. That's what we call the first reaction of the citric acid cycle, which was the citrate synthase. Okay, that made citrate. When citrate starts to accumulate, then this transport system kicks in and it kicks citrate out into the cytoplasm. Okay? Kick citrate out to the cytoplasm. Notice they're omitting a step here. What do we have to do to go from here to here? What have they left out? This has to get oxidized to acetyl-CoA, right? Okay. So they've left that step out of there, but that's, that's what's happening. Now, citrate starts to accumulate. Under what conditions will citrate start to accumulate? Well, a lot of ATP, when we have a lot of ATP. Sitting around, drinking beer, eating pizza, watching the tube, not exercising, right? What happens to, why does, it, why does that happen then? Why, why does that cause citrate to accumulate? You agree we have a high ATP, but why does high ATP cause citrate to accumulate? Well, that's, that's Carl? Okay, so, so, sort of an answer. All right, so <laughs> I'm not trying to make fun of you, Carl. All right, so ATP accumulates. When ATP accumulates, your right ATP synthase will stop because you run out of ADP. When you run out of ADP and citrate, ATP synthase stops, then what happens to the proton gradient? Up. Always think through all these steps. You can track anything down with this. Proton gradient goes up. What happens when proton gradient goes up? Electron transport stops, right? Okay? Oxygen consumption stops. We're not breathing heavily when we're watching the tube unless we're watching something we're not supposed to, I think, right? Okay? <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, sorry. <laughs> okay. Let's get our minds back on biochemistry here, folks. Oxygen consumption stops. Electron transport stops. Right? <laughs> We're going to have to sing or something today. I don't know what to say here. Electron. <laughs> Does anybody else want to go through this for me? <laughs> Electron transport stops. What happens to NAD concentration? It goes down. When NAD concentration goes down, what happens to citric acid cycle? It stops. When citric acid cycle stops, where does it stop? It stops at the first place where NAD is needed. That's isocitrate. When isocitrate accumulates, what happens to the concentration of citrate? It goes up. Now we know why this happens. Now we know why we make fatty acid. Okay? So again, this scenario I gave you, if you're sitting around, eating too much, not getting enough exercise, you're going to make fat. Now you know why that happens. Because when the citrate gets out to the cytoplasm, look what happens to it. Acetyl-CoA. And what is acetyl-CoA used for? Making fatty acids, making fat. Make sense? Clear as mud? Yes, Marcia. How fast are you processing? How fast this process is going on? It's, it's, it's a hard question to answer because what's happening is you have a, what's called a flux. Okay? So probably at any given time, unless, you know, when you're, unless you're exercising a lot, this is probably just going back and forth doing this. And so, to some extent, you're, you're making this unless you're really exercising heavily. When you're exercising heavily, of course, you're going to be, you're going to be producing all kinds of things to um, 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 generate energy. Okay, so that's that's what's going to happen with that. 
But the question, uh, the other question about it was how fast can these happen? And if, if we compare the speed with which this happens with respect to, say, glycogen breakdown or glucose metabolism, those processes will happen faster than this because they don't involve transport in and out of the mitochondrion. They're happening in the cytoplasm already. And so this will, by, ne by necessity, be a slower process. Okay? The same is true of getting the fatty acids into the mitochondrion. Remember, we had to shuttle them in through on, on the, the backs of carnitine, right? To get them into carnitine, then we had that, that took a shuttle getting it in. And so we may go across a membrane like that. That's going to slow things down. Okay. Um, well, okay, let's see. That's fatty acid biosynthesis. What else did I want to say here? Pathway integration, their figures are pretty dumb for this. That's what's happening. That's what, that ties fatty acid metabolism into everything else, but I think it's kind of dumb figures. So I, I like my own method better of describing it to you, tracking things down. There you see is, in fact, the pentose phosphate pathway that makes the NADPH that's necessary for making fatty acids. So that is shown on there. I think to make the day a good day, we should finish with a song. And so I have a song for this occasion. And to make it easy for you, it's a song that's the same tune as the song we, the tune we sang last time. Except for instead of being about fatty, fatty acid oxidation, we're talking about fatty acid synthesis. Please join me. The 16 carbon fatty acid palmitate. That's the that it needs from acetate, which citric acid helps release from mitochondria matrices. Oh, a shuttle's great when acids are synthesized. Carboxylase takes substrate and it puts within dioxycarbon carried on a biotin. Coase all gain a quick release replaced by larger ACPs, and it all begins when acids are synthesized. A malinate contributes to the growing chain. Two carbon seven times around again, again. For saturated acylates, there's lots of NADPH that you must obtain when acids are synthesized. Palmitic acid made this way all gets released. Desaturases act to make omega threes. Next time, the fast products, big and small, form esters with the glycerol, so you get obese when acids are synthesized. Okay, good enough. See you guys. <laughs> See you guys on Wednesday. How you doing? So the vitamin B12 that has the cobalt in it, that looks like a heme with the iron. It does. I hate to say it. It does look like the heme. Uh, in the sense that it actually holds on to something and uh, 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 helps as a result of that, yes. Because it, it it's, it's like holding on, uh, not no, it doesn't move like the heme, but it is in fact holding on to a methyl group that, and it's moving a methyl group. I didn't show you the mechanism, but it actually is moving a methyl group in the thing. Okay. So in that sense, the cobalt is acting like the iron is in a heme. Okay. So there's a resemblance, but the, but vitamin B12 is, is is a different structure. It's not the same structure. Not the same. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you for the interview prep. I'm three. Oh, good. So far on interviews. Good for you, Ryan. So, thank you very Wonderful. much. Wonderful. You're more than welcome. How does the body decide to make fat after it makes fat? Like when you're sitting around and you watch the fat. It's not there. regulated. So once fatty acids are there, fat. It's not regulated. So when you don't have a regulated process, it's driven only by concentration. So why would you turn the fatty acids into acetyl? away and make energy. Well, you would if you need, if, if the energy pathway was running. If the energy pathway is not running, right. then you're making fat. Yeah. Hello. Hey, Mike, what's up? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And then the last step of the neutral body synthesis is the creation of the hydroxy butyrate. Is that hydroxy butyrate? Is that... Is that an enzymatic reaction? Yes, yes. The only one that's not is... is, is